Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I'm Jonathan Fay, Principal Architect on Microsoft Worldwide Telescope, and we have a special guest today here, uh, Tony Butterfield from the Houston Museum of Natural Science, who's going to be showing us some uh, very cool stuff uh, that they've been working on. He basically is, uh, does production for their full dome shows that uh, not only involve their planetarium, but also uh, visualizing Earth and environmental uh, concepts and things like that. So they've been really groundbreaking in the planetarium field uh, for quite a long time, including being the first di full digital, uh, full, uh, full dome digital planetarium system um, back in 1998, and they were the first uh, uh, sky scan uh, installation for the full dome digital. They uh, do uh, video production uh, that uh, is not only used for their own in house internal shows, but also distributed uh, worldwide. And their program also. Um, uh, it makes use of uh, uh, this um, adjunct program that uh, uh, Tony's boss runs that uh, distributes uh, uh, inflatable digital planetariums through classrooms uh, uh, all over the U.S., I believe. And worldwide. And worldwide, yes. And, and so the, the shows are not only done in bricks and mortar planetarium, but as well as these inflatables that go all over. Um, and it's really kind of completely changed the way uh, people think about planetariums. Anyway, without any further ado, uh, this is Tony Butterfield. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Tony, and I work at the Planetarium at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. The Houston Museum is one of the largest museums in the country, but the Planetarium is one of the most progressive in the world. What I'm going to talk about today is some of the changes that we have contributed to the industry over uh, the past 20 years, and I've played a big role in pushing the technology to the next level. When I started in the planetarium field over 20 years ago, there was just a big machine in the middle of the room, a bunch of baby food jars uh, used for special effects, and a lot of slide projectors. Uh, back then, if you look at what was going on in 1991, we were working with a, a whopping powerful system of um, uh, Apple IIe's and uh, 46 uh, computers. And I thought it would be uh, fun to kind of take a look back at how uh, it all started as far as animation 20 years ago. Uh, over the years, I've tried to help push the new technology along in the planetarium field. Uh, I'm like the beta guy that always has the pre-release version. So uh, in preparing this uh, presentation, I got lucky and found the uh, commercial that changed my life for the better that helped me get started, which ultimately impacted the industry and what you see out there in the theater today. What's fun when you look at these old commercials is uh, the graphical interface or some of the, the, the speed performance. And so I put this together just to, to have a little bit of fun looking back. Every transition, every transition. Digital effect, digital effect. Graphic, graphic. Title, title, and animation, animation. You're about to see, you're about to see. Was created entirely with the video toaster, the video toaster from New Tech. Remember how it used to be? In science, they call it a paradigm shift. Yeah, a paradigm. Oh, what? What's that? One historical moment. The sun revolves around the earth. Yeah. The next moment. Enter Copernicus. Wasn't he Polish? And voila. The same as Shogun. The Earth revolves around the Sun. Shows you how things can change. Right now, this very moment, as we speak, a paradigm shift of equal magnitude has grabbed the world of video. A paradigm shift. And the force behind the shift. We at New Tech. Call the video toaster. Hey, that's a hot name. Yeah. And we assure you, once you've seen what our toaster can do, I'm ready. The world of video will never look the same again.
40 years for the computer to evolve from a garage size shrine to a desktop tool. But with the video toaster, it happened as quick as snap. We're not talking evolution here. We're talking revolution. See, the way things used to be, add two VCRs and an editor, and you have a full-blown post-production suite. This is what I call a video revolution. That's just what it is. And here's another reason why. Lightwave 3D. Lightwave. With Lightwave, you have the excitement of three-dimensional graphics. How's it work? Easy. You begin by creating wireframe models with the Lightwave model. Yeah. Then, you use the Lightwave renderer to give it three-dimensional life. Hey, that looks real. It's real, all right, real easy. You're the director, the next Walt Disney. <laughs> you position objects, camera, and lights just by sliding the mouse. Then, when you're ready, Lightwave will animate your scene just like this. Or like this. Neat. Or this. <laughs> Crazy. Or this. Yeah. And all this is included in the price of the toaster. You bet. It's each separate piece of production equipment that you need to make real broadcast quality television. Combined into one device with one easy to use interface. No wonder I've heard so much about this. Now you know why. It's changing the world of video forever. You see, when NewTek created the video toaster, our goal wasn't to be as good as, it was to be better. It wasn't just evolution. It was revolution. A leap. A shift. Yeah, the paradigm shift. So buckle up your seatbelt, Jack, and open up your mind. And let the video toaster take you places you've never been before. was a, a lot of fun. Uh, after I saw that and I had been working in the planetarium field, the very first animation you saw was about uh, astronomy and from that point on I was hooked. Uh, at the end of that video there was a still frame of just one of the uh, uh, frames that was being rendered out. Uh, it took six minutes and 49 seconds to render that frame out and uh, I quickly figured out that it takes a long time to make animation. Um, <laughs> ever since then, there's always been a quest to be able to render faster and faster. Um, it, at one point, there were even tricks of hooking up a deck alpha to an Amiga workstation, and the workstation did all the graphics and send the jobs out to the alpha. Uh, I, <coughs> uh, I have another uh, short little video that pokes fun at uh, trying to solve those solutions, and a lot of times when we're rendering animations, even 20 years later, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. And uh, so I wanted to show this too. If you've been following along with our course, then you're now the proud owner of a dedicated 3D graphics workstation, costing only $65,000. Trust us when we say you'll be indebted to it for many years to come. Today, we'll take a look at the many exciting pastimes you can explore while waiting for images to render. Through the years, professional 3D animators have become pioneers in exciting fields such as dictionary proofreading, 
and chess by mail. However, few things can match the exotic thrill of learning a foreign language. Espero por el computador estar un trabajo. I'm waiting for the machine to make a picture. El computador costa más de un casa. My machine costs more than a house. Paciencia es virtuoso. Patience is a virtue. <laughs> So uh, even from then, it was um, a slow start to getting any kind of animation out there. Um, talk about backing up your stuff. How many of you have uh, your files backed up from 20 years ago? I was pretty impressed when I tripped across my very first animation. It's uh, 10 seconds long, and it took a week uh, to render. I found most of the frames, and um, uh, it, it stops a little bit short, but after uh, getting the software, I wanted to be able to contribute to the planetarium industry by making scientifically accurate animations, and uh, being able to create our own in-house animations was an effort to uh, make that possible. Back then, uh, <coughs> animations were recorded on a single frame recording VCR. You would render one frame, the VCR would back up, record one thirtieth of a second, and then you'd wait and render another frame, and that went on for weeks. Uh, <coughs> so that was a whole lot of fun. That was, that's uh, uh, 20 years ago when I first started. Um, but in order to get where we are today, I wanted to take us uh, back and look at a historical perspective of planetariums. Uh, planetariums have been around uh, for thousands of years as mankind's quest to recreate the nighttime sky. In the beginning, they were celestial globes that depicted the stars and mechanical models which uh, recreated the motion of the planets. Shortly after World War II, a German company named Zeiss combined the two and created what we know of as the classical planetarium. The classical planetarium is probably the planetarium that you went to in third grade with the big machine in the middle of the room. Uh, Chicago was the first planetarium in the United States to get uh, one of these expensive uh, machines, shortly followed by New York, LA, and other, other major cities. Um, <clears throat> they were super expensive, and, uh, and so a part-time planetarium employee uh, decided to create a low-cost version, and that was known as the Splitz Pl Spitz Planetarium by Armin Spitz. Thousands of these were sold because they were the Volkswagen of the planetarium industry. If you go to most cities around uh, America, your chances are you're going to come across a Spitz Planetarium. As far as um, uh, the digital universe goes, by uh, the 1980s, the uh, technology advanced enough that uh, we started to introduce computer technologies into the planetarium theater. A uh, military uh, defense contractor named Evans and Sutherland that specialized in uh, aircraft simulations had a small little division where they put together the first computer-generated star field. This was done by a high-resolution uh, or high-voltage CRT that uh, was underneath a fisheye lens, and uh, it allowed for you, for the first time, to look at the stars not as viewed from the surface of the Earth. Uh, this really changed the way educators could teach uh, students the stars and the relationship uh, of the Earth in the cosmos. The problem was uh, it was all wireframe. That's cool and fun, and you can do a lot of fun things with wireframe, but it would be 15 more years before we'd get solid objects. Uh, eventually, you would have controlled, uh, s controlled planetariums where they would have two or more uh, systems running at the same time. Ultimately, uh, one project had a digital uh, star machine and the top of the line optical star machine. Uh, but then after a while, it was just a, a matter of how much stuff can you cram into a planetarium. 
uh, more baby food jars, more spaghetti colanders, uh, more slide projectors, and uh, more video projectors. At that point in time, video projectors were well, like a small Volkswagen and they would put them up on steel pan tilt mounts and it was like uh, trying to program a car to look in a certain direction on the dome. The thing about it was uh, it got us thinking about producing content in the full dome format um, but uh, we were just using uh, dozens of separate systems all dancing at the same time to pull off the full dome experience. Uh, if you went to a planetarium, uh, you probably, chances are, went to a laser show. If you were near a big city, your, your last experience of going to the planetarium was probably uh, seeing a, a Led Zeppelin or a Pink Floyd show. Laser shows were a, a very important part of the planetarium industry because in uh, Friday and Saturday night uh, revenue, you could pay for all of your expenses for the rest of the week. The uh, laser show industry uh, used the planetarium as a venue uh, to develop its technology, and we embraced that in the planetarium field by ultimately creating the first full dome laser system, which then could display a, a video not a video, but a laser graphic image across the whole dome. Uh, so we have all these different sy systems going at one time or another. And from a production point of view, it was really complex trying to keep all these balls up in the air. I produced uh, quite a few laser shows and I actually found them to be a little bit more uh, complicated than doing video because you have to get every note of the music, you have to get every uh, uh, tempo change, you have so much more complexity going on and if it's just not synced right then you know everybody knows it. Uh, basically these were cell animations cycled through quickly and so they all had to be drawn out ahead of time, digitized, and then reprojected out with a laser projector. We did a lot of cool things with lasers and combining them with the, uh, educational programs because they could do color and the Digistar could only draw a green wireframe. We actually used the combination of the two to tell uh, the story and to make it more of an engaging experience. The OmniScan, like I said, was the full, uh, full dome laser system and it would be uh, combined with uh, other equipment to create the same experience. Uh, right about that time, digital video was uh, becoming more commonplace and the first use of a digital disc recorder uh, was introduced and that is the concept that everybody knows of today as TiVoing, but the idea of recording a video sequence onto a hard drive and having it play back. Um, that was a big breakthrough in the sense that you didn't have to uh, print to a single frame recording VCR or you wanted to make edits just like typing a paper, you would just cut and paste. Uh, I was one of the first people to use a, um, a disc playback system and um, we were sitting around in a conference and I said, you know, someday we're going to be shipping shows around on these hard drives and uh, it'll be, you know, easy to be able to share content between city and city because then you wouldn't have to worry about how many baby food jars they had in order to make the special effects. Uh, what we have today is basically um, multiple channels of those disc playback and um, all combined together at one time. Uh, as we got more sophisticated with the technology, we also had to uh, mature in our production styles. Uh, not only did we have laser uh, going in all parts of the dome, uh, we had um, analog uh, s uh, projection that were made either with painting rotating pieces of glass or a shower curtain, uh, slide projectors, but the whole concept of how to produce for the full dome uh, was starting to take place. One of the first things I pointed out was uh, as you moved in and under and around things, you had to proportionally change the point of view of the object. Up until that point, everything was edge on and it didn't quite work right. So the idea is that if you were to go underneath the planet, you should be able to see the bottom of the planet. And since I could make the animations, then it was easy to incorporate into the show. 
Then came Full Dome Video, the, the concept of being able to take all those different video projectors and combine them into an edge blended system uh, became available. There were earlier attempts that didn't quite uh, make it, but uh, in 1998 uh, the technology became available and we were the first to install that at the Houston Museum. Uh, what we have is a multi-channel edge blended system and depending on the specific location it might be uh, six projectors or eight projectors or in some places they've tried with 12 projectors. But the whole point is, is there's not one single high resolution video projector that can cover the surface of the dome. So in order to gain the resolution we have to combine multiple projectors together. This is what we call a dome master. It's basically a fisheye format projection. In this uh, format, the bottom of the screen or the bottom of the image below the satellite dish is what we call the front of the room. Uh, you have to imagine if you're sitting in your chair in the planetarium that the satellite dish is at the bottom of the room. Uh, the east on this image is the left side of the room. Uh, and the back of the room, if you were to turn around in your seat, would be at the top of the image where it says north. This is the standard format that we use to trade uh, content between other planetariums. And this is, uh, makes it uh, allow for the quality of production to be shared from big, big productions down to uh, small cities and maintaining the quality of the value, uh, <clears throat> the value of the production. In the, uh, these are some more examples of the dome master fisheye format. We can take panoramas and stitch them together and have it properly distorted. And on the right hand side, we've even gone so far as having a fisheye lens on the space station and they regularly send us pictures so that we can incorporate that into educational programs. Later on, I'm going to talk about how um, our next project is to combine all those years worth of astronaut photography into uh, a show. One of, the thing that has, one of the things that has stayed consistent over the years, be it uh, high-tech digital or old-fashioned analog, is this debate uh, from one institution to another of what's called live versus taped. Uh, Fifty years ago, it was a live operator with a pointer standing in the middle of the planetarium giving a lecture and answering questions uh, by the audience. Uh, in contrast to live, then you had a pre-recorded soundtrack. It played uh, the same uh, music, same presentation each time. The advantage of that is, is that the school kids got to see the same thing each time and could be consistently tested to make sure that they were exposed to the same material. Today in modern times, that uh, debate is uh, transferred to the future, not from live versus tape, but to be real time through a graphics ge image generator or pre-rendered uh, in a production. So the same style uh, varies from institution to institution and uh, the, the method of conveying the information. That's the debate that will never end. Um, <clears throat> the gap between uh, the big planetariums that had full dome systems and all the other cities uh, got wide. Uh, the big cities who had the money could buy the big systems, quickly leaving behind uh, m medium sized cities, museums, educational uh, institutions. And so we received a grant to create the first portable full dome system. Uh, this is an example of an inflatable dome, much like the one that's out in the hallway. Our very first full dome system was using a fisheye lens and a uh, video projector. And since we had a surplus of slide projector stands sitting around, we thought we'd strap it to that. And that was the first portable digital uh, video projector um, all the way back from um, 2004 and 2005. The problem there is that the glass is insanely expensive. Uh, that lens is $16,000 alone and it's married to the design of that projector. So as soon as that obsoletes, uh, you're stuck with an expensive piece of glass. Uh, plus, uh, we would send these out on the road each day to part-timers to go to gymnasiums at schools and, and if they dropped it or you've got an expensive uh, package in a small spot. So even though that was an affordable solution to the multi-million dollar full dome planetarium, that was still an expensive uh, little purchase 
uh, the obsoleted uh, very fast, and um, we th tried to come up with something better. Uh, in 2001, I saw uh, an example of an alternative to the, f to the fisheye, but you got to remember back then we were still dealing with NTS video, and so anytime you take standard definition video and you stretch it over 50 feet wide, you see scan lines and pixels, and so although the concept of putting um, a image up on the dome was mathematically feasible, we didn't have source material to be able to deliver to it. Uh, in 2001, I saw a demonstration of the uh, concept of bouncing a video image off of a spherical mirror, which, much like with telescopes, takes the cost savings advantage of using a mirror instead of a lens to display the graphics up onto the dome. Uh, it turns out that a uh, what I call warped fisheye image is basically in software a 360 degree fisheye uh, turned back on to itself. So many of the software packages nowadays can create a fisheye image. We just need the uh, portion that covers the dome. Um, what we have done since then is we've made a portable uh, self-contained system that you can use to take on the airplane or in a small of a, a back seat of a small car. Uh, but then you're not married to a piece of optics. In this picture here, you see um, a, a standard prosumer home theater video projector, a spherical mirror, and uh, right about here should be a flat mirror. Basically, what the optical path is, is the light comes out of the video projector off of the flat mirror and then hits the curved mirror. What we do in our content is we pre-distort it in the content so that by the time it hits the uh, curved mirror, the curved mirror straightens it back out when it hits the dome. Now that is a huge breakthrough and a cost savings because you can swap out these projectors because the mirror doesn't care. And if you bang up the mirror, you can swap that out pretty easily. So it's off the shelf technology. It's easy to do. It's something that people can relate to. Just like with astronomy, you have advantages with uh, uh, refractor telescopes and you have advantages with reflector telescopes. Well, we're incorporating that same technology into a low cost uh, portable solution. This is an example of uh, the opening of one of our shows in what I call this warped fisheye format. Um, the same forces that bring the, cool breeze in spring are warm The dead center the front of the room is right around the word full, and as you move along the bottom of the image, <clears throat> so this is the front of the room, this is the left side of the room, this is the right side of the room, and this, all this back here is the back of the room. This is 16 by 9, so it can be displayed uh, off of a Blu-ray player or it can be edited in standard off-the-shelf home uh, editing software. So you don't need a special format or for a uh, uh, special aspect ratio. For the most powerful events in the air, over the ocean, and even from the sun, we reserve the title Force 5. When you see that Oceans up on the dome, it's pretty scary. Um, I wanted to stop right here because this also introduces some of the other things that we have been doing in Houston, and that's uh, almost everything in addition to astronomy and the other sciences we've been expanding. Uh, the most uh, obvious is earth science, uh, looking back at the earth. And so in this part, we're going to tell a whole 
uh, seen about how ocean currents and wind currents affect the weather. But the whole point is, is that the planetarium is not just for looking at the stars, but also teaching Earth and other sciences. We have, uh, just in order to be able to survive uh, in our own institution, because it's a major institution, we have competition within our own building. We have an IMAX theater, we have a butterfly center, we have two or three uh, exhibits, a couple uh, gift shops. So we're not just trying to get the visitors to come to our building, but once we get them to our building, we're even fighting to get them to pay money for a ticket to go to one of our shows. This is a collection of some of the uh, movie posters that uh, I brought with me. And uh, we have learned uh, that because we are low madam on the totem pole when it comes to marketing and budgeting and things like that, we have to go along with what the museum is doing. So over time, if the museum gets a big exhibit, in order to take advantage of what they're doing and to ride along on that marketing train, uh, then we'll go ahead and produce a show that corresponds with that. Uh, I don't know if the Titanic exhibit has made it through museums in this part, but we had the Titanic exhibit and so we made a planetarium show that went along with it. We also work with uh, scientists uh, during the International uh, Polar Year. We uh, worked with uh, polar scientists and glacier scientists to create a uh, show that helped us learn about ice on our planet so we could better understand ice on other planets. And that was called Ice Worlds. One of our most uh, successful shows of all time was something that we, uh, it's one of those one hit wonders you're just shocked it happened. It's called Earth's Wild Ride. It is now translated into 18 different languages. It's shown around the world and basically it's a story of a grandfather on the moon with his grandkids looking at Earth and he's telling to the grandkids what it's like to be on the Earth and why it's green, why it's white, the way it used to be. And so it's a story, and, uh, and it's, it's uh, been the most successful. We're kind of making an updated sequel to that next year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Our biggest project has been uh, to get ready for the demise of the planet. Uh, the end of the world is coming, and uh, so we've prepared for that. And yes, we do sacrifice somebody. It's an intern, that's where they all go. Um, we had actually a lot of stress over the sacrifice uh, scene. We showed it to a lot of board members and special discussion groups. Do you show a sacrifice to kids at a museum? Well, if you're going to be truthful to the culture of the people of that time period and to show what uh, it was like back then, then to keep the sacrifice in would be um, accurate to the context of the people. Uh, but then if you've got little kids, you want to really explain to them that they're scooping out a bleeding heart and showing it to everybody in the audience. So we are offering that show in two uh, versions. That show opened two weekends ago and uh, it has overnight tripled our attendance over the weekend. So um, that might be our next big all-time uh, big hit. The end of the world is only going to happen in the United States. If you actually talk to the people that are in the know in Central America or, or Mayan people, the Mayan believe in uh, time uh, basically looping, kind of like when we go from uh, winter to spring and things start over and bloom and blossom again. Uh, it's just a, a repeating cycle of one cycle after another for them. And so if they were here, they're actually going to be out partying and encouraging it to happen as, you know, the sooner the better. 
so that's that's American media. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, what's going on now. It, it's like uh, hurry up and waiting with the hardware. Uh, well, now uh, the software is finally catching up. A lot of the high-end 3D packages now have either plugins or built into the camera rigs the capability to uh, render in a fisheye format. Uh, but uh, there are more software uh, applications that are on purposely including in their design the fisheye format uh, to be able to display uh, their software into the dome. One of uh, the best uh, pieces of software that we've been working with so far is the Worldwide uh, Telescope Project uh, with the help of Jonathan. Uh, I started working with him a couple years ago about what uh, what it might be not in a desktop version but in a uh, educators, planetarium operators uh, version. And since I'm a content creator, I've been bugging him like crazy on, on tools on how to make stuff real fast. Uh, I've started incorporating uh, the Worldwide Telescope into my uh, production workflow, and already in two shows, I've quickly been able to uh, add content to our shows with the help of Worldwide Telescope. Uh, there's a couple other software packages that's worth mentioning. Uh, as I had said before, live versus tape or real-time versus uh, rendered. One of the uh, other areas that we're uh, aggressively looking into as far as real-time, uh, and that uh, was made possible with a game, an affordable game engine called Unity 3D. With Unity 3D, we've been able to uh, distort the uh, graphics to properly uh, match the dome, and we have created a uh, educational game that goes along with the Mayan Planetarium show so that they can both watch the production, learn about the, the people, and then as a team go in with assignments and task cards and explore the city of Tikal in real time. The whole problem has been, well, who gets the drive? has been eliminated because as you work as a team, somebody's the geologist, somebody's the biologist, somebody's the navigator, and then everybody has a job and you have to find certain things on your task card. Uh, and so that's how we're combining Unity 3D as a game engine to quickly generate the full dome graphics. It also has allowed for me to do pre-visualization of scenes, complex scenes, very fast. And so uh, we were able to, as a placeholder, put a scene uh, into our mind show to see if it was going to work, all created in Unity 3D. Once it passed inspection, then we sent it off to the render farm to be ray traced and properly textured. Um, the future of full dome production uh, has a, a, a long way to go. Uh, it's starting to get the attention of other film producers. Uh, the live action capability of being able to capture a full dome image is a little bit challenging. Uh, there's a higher than HD camera called the RED where people have tried to put a fisheye lens onto the front of the RED camera. Uh, it's a huge waste of pixels because the, the fisheye lens truncates the CCD and uh, you, you pay a lot per pixel. Uh, one of the things that I did was I got what's called the Ladybug and it is a camera system that has uh, six cameras pointing in different directions, uh, five along the uh, horizon and one straightening up. This brings up a whole new area of cinematography challenges. Where do you put the camera crew when you can see everything around you? Well, in this case, I had to be the camera crew underneath the camera. Uh, and so I, with a couple of batteries and a backpack and uh, my camera system, walked around Central America and everybody thought I worked for uh, Google or Earth or something. But uh, we have uh, looked at that as a way to uh, set up a scene and we used it for the first time in the Mayan production. Uh, it's awfully expensive and it has uh, some shortcomings. One of the other alternative, uh, oh, this is a fun shot. I was, uh, I got up in the wee hours in the morning to watch the sunrise uh, at this temple, and these girls walked up right in the middle of my time-lapse photo. <laughs> so I said hi, and I was nice to them. But I'm hiding there underneath the camera, and they're like, what's that? And so 
Uh, that scene's not in the show. But this is what the ladybug captures. Uh, I poked something on this screen. Uh, basically, the ladybug, if I hit it again, oh, the ladybug, like I said, takes a uh, two by one uh, uh, lat long uh, image and the only blind spot is underneath it and that's why it's black on the bottom. Uh, once we get it out of the ladybug format and into the production pipeline, uh, it's good because then we can composite uh, CGI elements in the foreground and use it as the background. But it's the first attempt in a full dome production to use real world photography and um, there's more to come. Um, just a brief note, I don't have a picture of it here, but like you'll see here uh, where we're taking a video projector and bouncing an image off of the mirror, well, I've uh, done some testing of reversing that process and putting a HD camera or a higher than HD camera in the place of the projector so that you capture what comes off of the mirror and it's already in the distorted format. Because it's 16 by 9 and it's already in the distorted format, you could quickly edit together your show and then play it back through your media player and you have uh, the proper format, format. Uh, you have 30 frames per second, it's high resolution and I think that's a, a good way to go. Um, much like uh, any toolbox, there are better tools for some scenes than others. Uh, with the fisheye format, uh, that was more suitable in some scenarios and using the mirror, the ladybug might be better for other scenarios. So there's not a camera uh, that can solve all your, your cinematography questions, you now need to have a toolbox to be able to pick and choose as a producer what you want to draw upon. Uh, some software tools being used in our current production. Uh, I've quickly come to enjoy uh, the Microsoft ICE Panorama Stitching Program. Uh, and that is a program that uh, is capable of taking pictures that were pointed in fairly close uh, uh, in the, if you're fairly close in the same spot, it'll stitch it together real fast. Um, Worldwide Telescope, uh, like I had mentioned, allows for us to image uh, content and with its frame output capability quickly be able to uh, have it reviewed to, uh, to be edited or uh, to expand onto. Microsoft Photosynth is um, the, uh, in what I'm using it for is, along with the astronauts that took pictures for us inside the space station, they're now taking the database of images of the outside of the space station and running it through this process. And as I'm mo modeling and setting up the scenes, I'm able to look at the space station from different points of view that are in registration. Uh, that's helped me out a lot in my current project. Then there's uh, uh, a couple other high-end uh, uh, panorama stitching programs, uh, your standard Photoshop, After Effects, and I'm a lightweight fan. <clears throat> One of the uh, things I really wanted to um, uh, leave on is the astronauts uh, who have volunteered their time to take pictures on the space station. Their time is so choreographed that they have to get a note to, 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 to go to a baseball game. And when we came to them with the idea of taking a fisheye lens into orbit and taking pictures for us and sending it back uh, down to help uh, teach kids what it's like to be in space, uh, <clears throat> it had to be at their own free time if they wanted to do it. And we started out with 100 speed film in two, 2007. And since then, we've uh, been using higher resolution camera bodies. This picture on the right is actually a good, a good shot. This is another example of, um, well, uh, this is actually a panorama in the fisheye format. But there's a couple key astronauts in there that has taken a huge amount of pictures um, inside and outside the space station. And that's Mike Bear and Jeff uh, Williams. And um, he, I think Jeffrey Williams is one of the key people that did the, the photosynth uh, collection. Uh, astronaut Scott Perenczynski is on our um, museum board 
And a few years ago when they had the crisis in orbit where the solar panel ripped apart, uh, he was the one who got sent out to fix it with a set of cufflinks. That was the mission that they were going to take all of our pictures. But since they had the emergency to deal with, uh, I ended up with 19 good ones. So we were happy with 19 good ones, and from there we kept encouraging uh, them to take more. This is down in NASA on the left-hand side. This is a part of their training facilities that are eventually going to be given away. But we took down one of our portable planetariums, like what you see out in the hallway, and we uh, uh, let them uh, take pictures and then look at it in the dome format. But then what we also figured out was it's about the same size of what was going to be the Constellation uh, capsule. And so we started to uh, write a grant to um, teach kids about the future of the space program and the Constellation spacecraft. Well, we submitted for a grant, we uh, got awarded the grant, and then a week later NASA canceled the Constellation Space Program. So now we have a grant to teach about the future of uh, space and space exploration, but no vehicles to talk about. Uh, these are some more uh, astronauts that uh, eventually went up a, a, a couple more times uh, with three of our fisheye lenses. Uh, and and hopefully uh, in the next week they'll take some more uh, from the cupola, which is the new window that looks down on the Earth. Uh, this is another, this is Nicole Stott. She went up and uh, she was real helpful on taking pictures for us uh, and sending them back down. But every couple months everything changes around. So trying to um, teach kids what it's like to be on the space station uh, it's always changing. Vehicles are coming, vehicles are going, the inside are get, is getting rearranged. I went to go look for where the bathroom is, and the bathroom has now moved to another part of the space station. So now the Robonaut is now sitting where the bathroom used to be. Well, so now we finally got enough pictures to be able to see how things have changed before and after, and be able to see and teach the kids. So that's our next project, is to teach about um, uh, space flight, human space flight, going to the orbit and then uh, beyond orbit to the moon. This is a uh, pre-production version of a scene for our next project of going to a lunar base on the south pole of the moon. And just to remind you, when we were looking at this, that, that the front of the room is down here. Directly overhead is right here and to the left is over here and behind you is way up here. So the action when we produce our, our content is uh, what I call the sweet spot, about 35 degrees up, because when you're sitting in your chair, you, you kind of get a field of view of about 100 degrees wide, or 120, 130 degrees wide, uh, 80 or 90 degrees tall. Now, we don't currently do stereo uh, projection in our planetarium. Stereo projection has uh, been done in several different methods. Uh, it's very impressive, but much like Hollywood, the, the, the verdict is still out if it's worth the extra trouble to render everything twice. Um, some of the newest technology uh, involves rendering at 8K. Uh, that's a circled rendered image that's 8,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels. And if you're talking about rendering time, that's a lot of rendering time even on today's new computers. Uh, stereo means you have to have two channels, and that's like two sets of 4K, which still adds up to the same amount of render time. And so um, there, it's, it, it's fun to watch, it's engaging, it's impressive, but is it really worth the extra cost to render it out, uh, given the limited funds there are to do some of these projects? Uh, it's still kind of up in the air. Most of our projects are, are funded uh, all or in part by grants, and so we have to cover certain scenes in the show that's paid for by some grant, and we end up recycling some pieces from previous shows, editing them together with new shows, get new grants to redo old stuff, and so we do the most uh, in Houston with the least amount of money. And um, so this is our current pr production. Um, that's about it uh, for an introduction to the digital planetarium, the portable planetarium that's out in the hallway, how we have 
uh, come from uh, a ball with holes poked in it and, uh, and light shining out to, uh, to a big mechanical machine in the middle of the room to these digital projectors that uh, allow for us to uh, create these uh, amazing images. This is one of my favorite photos uh, that we got uh, back uh, from the cupola and it's a little bright uh, but the fisheye lens is looking at a Soyuz, <clears throat> uh, Soyuz spacecraft. The tail of the orbiter is off on the side and um, oh there's another shot where they put the fisheye lens closer to the window and then we can see it uh, all at once. The problem is, is uh, what we wanted to do was to be able to do a complete orbit of the Earth with the camera. Uh, and that would mean maybe taking a frame every five seconds. But they can't take high capacity cards into space. So they have a shoebox of like eight gig cards. And so you can't get many frames at 27 megapixels or 21 megapixels and have a worthwhile sequence because anytime you take the card out you bump it and it's never the same. So we're kind of uh, x-rays they, they, get just, they get damaged so they can't be flight rated. The high capacity cards can't be flight rated because you take the chance of not getting any of your data and so it's better to get a lot of your data all over the place than maybe not get your data at all. So uh, the other problem, which is a big stress, I guess it's an internal stress, because when I brought it up, everybody kind of like, is like, why can't you just write to the laptop hard drive? Well, NASA, like a lot of places, is grouped into different departments, and that's another department, which that whole concept is out of bounds. So uh, the quest for a nice image sequence is uh, still yet to come. And uh, as time, the problem now is, uh, and uh, me being from Houston, and I live on the side of town where NASA is, is most everybody's been laid off. In fact, the people that we worked with, the photo TV group, is no longer there. And so I went to go to call who the next in command is to uh, be our contact person, and it's really hard to get somebody on the phone. So it's a little sad in the sense that we've lost a heavy lift vehicle. Uh, a lot of people in Houston are now thinking that they had a really cool job that you know they would have forever. They now don't and so now they're having to look for jobs. But it's really kind of put a, a halt. And in the museum field we are informal educators and so we it's it's you know education that's not in a classroom we're trying to teach the kids, you know, why to take math classes, why to take science classes, what kind of careers. And so we're trying to, um, you know, give the, the kids, uh, you know, a glimpse of what might yet to become. And the, it's from the NASA point of view, uh, we're kind of in limbo right now. And so that's, that's a hard story to, to tell kids. Uh, the future of commercial space flight is promising. Uh, but they have a, a long learning curve and uh, trying to tell that story uh, is going to be a while. This is one of my uh, favorite shots from the cupola um, and I'll just leave it at that. If anybody has any questions or uh, I'm going to need a, a few more minutes to do some alignment uh, if you want to come uh, back and look at some of the uh, worldwide telescope in the dome. Uh, that can be fun as well. Will you, do, you have a, um, uh, a, a preview of the show as well that you can do? For yeah, the I have to transfer this laptop uh, out to uh, to the theater, to the portable. So it's a little bit of uh, unplugging and plugging things up, but we can show you some really cool stuff. And how long do we have? Uh, well, uh, a long coffee break. Okay. Like, what, 15 minutes? Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tony. I uh, appreciate you coming all the way out here and uh, look forward to seeing the show. For those of you who are watching uh, on the recorded version, we're going to try to get some of these uh, videos uh, from the Dome demos uh, captured so that they can be uh, edited in and added in. So if uh, uh, that works out, you'll see more video after this.
Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you guys later.